Uh, for those running the webcast, this is our 10 second warning. Good morning. I call this session of the Public Service Commission to order. Secretary Phillips, are there any changes to the final agenda? There are no changes to the final agenda. Thank you very much. Before I moving to the agenda, I'd like to conduct a roll call of the commissioners. When I call your name, please confirm that you are with us. Commissioner Diane Berman. Here. Commissioner James Alisi. Here. Commissioner Tracy Edwards. I am here. Commissioner David Valeski. Here. Commissioner John Majori. Here. Commissioner Rory Christian. Here. Thank you very much. For our first item of discussion today is item 201, cases 14M00494 et al. As they relate to the Clean Energy Fund review presented by Peggy Neville. Deputy Director of Efficiency and Innovation, and David Drexler, our managing attorney, will be available for questions. Peggy, will you please begin? Good morning, Chair Howard and Commissioners. Today I will be presenting Item 201, a draft order approving the Clean Energy Fund with modifications. The item before you represents the outcome of an interim review of the Clean Energy Fund as called for in the 2016 Order Authorizing the Clean Energy Fund Framework and responds to specific actions requested in a petition filed by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, on December 29, 2020. The 2016 Framework Order established the Clean Energy Fund, or CEF, as an umbrella funding mechanism that covers the majority of NYSERDA's post-2015 ratepayer-supported initiatives and expenditures. The CEF umbrella covers four active portfolios, which are one, market development, two, innovation and research, three, New York Sun, and four, New York Green Bank. It also includes expenditures associated with legacy portfolios, such as the Renewable Portfolio Standard and the Energy Efficiency Portfolio Standard, for which financial commitments had been made during their active program periods but for which expenditures have and will continue to occur after 2015. The CEF framework order established a suite of metrics and goals through 2025 for the four CEF portfolios to work in tandem to achieve. These metrics include energy efficiency megawatt hour reductions and MMBTU reductions, installed distributed renewable generation, greenhouse gas emission reductions, leveraged funds and participant bill savings. The framework order also established various requirements for the operation of the CEF and associated processes and reporting requirements. NYSERDA's petition presented performance information through 2019, which was subsequently updated through 2020, as well as specific actions it sought from the Commission to improve the operation of the CEF and further align it with evolving state energy policies, including the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or CLCPA. Ten sets of initial comments and five sets of reply comments were received on the petition. No comments were received in opposition to NYSERDA's petition, and commenters were generally supportive of the CEF and the petition. A few comments of note include the Joint Utilities and the City of New York recommended allocating additional funds to clean transportation and building efficiency. Multiple interveners, or MI, urged the Commission to ensure the continuation of initiatives targeting large CNI customers and to modify the surcharge so that it is not collected on a purely volumetric basis. MI objected to NYSERDA's proposal to revise CEF collection schedules unless the Commission was to rule that no incremental collections will be added after 2029 and the CEF will terminate at that time. The Joint Utilities objected to NYSERDA's proposal to be a member of the Technical Resource Manual Committee and recommended that collections beyond 2025 not be addressed at this time. As previously mentioned, the Commission established 10-year goals through 2025 for the CEF. While the achievement of these goals will not necessarily be linear, the approach taken for assessing progress to date is to look at each of the required metrics on a prorated basis compared to where we are in the CEF cycle. In other words, 
At 50% of the way through the CEF, our metrics near 50%. As detailed in the draft order, the CEF's overall performance is generally trending positively towards the goals established by the Commission. Two metrics are lagging, leveraged funds, a measure of how much non-ratepayer funds are supporting projects, and energy efficiency megawatt hour reductions. Leveraged funds, which through 2020 stand at 38% of the goal, has been primarily impacted by the steep decline in solar costs that was not predicted at the time of the CEF framework order. Therefore, while, the, while this particular metric may be lagging behind the original goal, the overall decline in solar cost is a positive for the market and for consumers. Megawatt hour reductions through 2020 stand at 27% of the goal, while MMBTU reductions stand at 130% of the goal. These results are primarily a function of market response. It is noted that when combining electric efficiency with other fuel efficiency on a total TBTU basis, the combined results are in line at approximately 55%. However, it is important for the CEF to continue to advance electric efficiency where possible particularly as the state begins to electrify its building stock. While NYSERDA's performance on the CEF is trending positively, expenditures have significantly lagged expectations. This has led to not only delayed realization of benefits, but to a larger cash balance than had been anticipated at the time of the CEF framework order. This is attributable to the slower than anticipated market uptake for many of the initiatives as well as attrition from legacy program commitments. While this variance predated the COVID pandemic, the results were further exacerbated by the impacts of the pandemic, including customer facing programs ceasing operations for at least one quarter during 2020 and other program areas facing substantial delays in advancing program activities. The item before you strongly reinforces the need for NYSERDA to put this funding to work effectively and expeditiously and requires additional measures to monitor expenditures against expectations. As mentioned, NYSERDA's petition includes a number of refinements to optimize the CEF, as well as further align the CEF with state energy policy. These, refi excuse me, <laughs> these refinements include strategies for the remaining build out of the market development, innovation and research and New York Green Bank portfolios with specific budget allocations, adoption of the goal of 40% of benefits of spending for disadvantaged communities pursuant to the CLCPA, updated performance targets and metrics for the CEF portfolio, including a shift from commitment-based to acquired-based targets, modifications to the CEF collections by year but not in total, use of uncommitted funds or reallocations from New York Green Bank to fully fund the New York Sun program, authorizing a formal role for NYSERDA on the Technical Resource Manual Committee, and other administrative improvements. The CEF is an integral component to the state's ability to deliver on its clean energy goals and complements ongoing efforts of the electric and gas utilities. The proposed elements put forth by NYSERDA to optimize the CEF with modifications will place a greater emphasis on timely achievement of metrics, provide clarity on the key primary metrics, are in line with current state energy policy objectives, and impose additional regulatory oversight and transparency. With regard to NYSERDA's proposed modification to collection schedules by year, but not in total, staff's review found that adoption of NYSERDA's proposal in combination with revised expenditure projections provided by NYSERDA would potentially result in a negative cash balance in 2025. Therefore, while the draft order adopts the proposal to modify collections by year, but not in total, it does so by making adjustments to the proposal put forth by NYSERDA. The item before you presents a modified schedule, which maintains collections as currently authorized through 2024 adjusts collections for 2025 through 2030, and eliminates collections after 2030. This approach takes account for revised cash flow projections, including necessary adjustments resulting from prior commission decisions that have repurposed uncommitted funds. 
These decisions have resulted in projected expenditures of funds earlier than that which would have resulted from their original purpose. The revised collection schedule avoids near-term volatility in collection levels and any disincentive for NYSERDA to increase the pace of expenditures. In addition, the draft order requires NYSERDA to provide an updated cash flow analysis on an annual basis to further monitor performance and direct staff to raise any concerns to the Commission in advance of the next CEF review if necessary. The draft order acknowledges that this interim review, while not contingent upon the CLCPA or Associated Climate Action Council process, is occurring during, the phase of C during this phase of CLCPA implementation. The order focuses on near-term improvements to CEF operations that should proceed immediately and recognizes the Commission may need to revisit the CEF as well as utility clean energy initiatives following the Climate Action Council's scoping plan process. The order, therefore, calls for the next CEF review to occur in 2023 and requires staff to align the next CEF review with that of the interim review called for in the January 2020 New Efficiency New York order, which established utility-administered energy efficiency and building electrification budgets and targets. This alignment will provide staff, or excuse me, <laughs> this alignment will provide stakeholders, staff, and the commission the opportunity to assess the full suite of ratepayer supported programs in the context of the CLCPA and in the context of one another to determine the best approaches to pursue. The order adopts NYSERDA's request to establish a new goal for the CEF as a whole to deliver 40% of benefits of spending to disadvantaged communities, as well as a New York Green Bank specific goal for 35% of post-2019 investments to benefit disadvantaged communities. These goals will significantly improve benefits to disadvantaged communities as compared to historic performance and are in compliance with the CLCPA. The draft order recognizes ongoing work being conducted by the Climate Justice Working Group and finalizing the criteria for disadvantaged communities, but does not delay the CEF from beginning to shift its portfolio in this manner. Therefore, the order adopts an interim definition for disadvantaged com communities criteria and requires additional steps for NYSERDA and New York Green Bank to undertake in developing its approaches to meet this goal and ensure true benefits are delivered to disadvantaged communities. Lastly, the order addresses several other administrative and process areas, including transparency and clarity of reporting, as well as improved coordination and driving more progress with the utilities energy efficiency program efforts, particularly in serving the low to moderate income sector. This concludes my presentation. David and I are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Peggy. Um, I have a couple of questions and then a couple of comments. First of all, I am concerned about the ongoing large cash balance that has occurred uh, over multiple years and um, and I do appreciate NYSERDA's re-emphasis on moving the money and, and recalculating it on projects actually going to fruition as opposed to commitments made. Uh, to that end, I have a question that I'm very hopeful that between now and 23, if we do not see movement uh, on these areas, particularly on, on movement of the cash to programmed uh, <clears throat> program goals. Uh, I, I'm counting on staff to tell this commission where the deficiencies may be, and particularly in those issues dealing with uh, moving the market. We have been trying to move the market now for some time, and that I see is maybe the biggest lag that we have seen. So changing consumer and behavior will be critical before, if we are ever to ultimately make the CLCPA goals a reality. Um, also a couple of comments, uh, particularly as it relates to our New York Sun program and our New York Solar Initiatives writ large. I do believe that we are one of the nation's leaders uh, on solar development and deployment. And I was very gratified by President Biden's commitment to more solar deployment and welcome yesterday's report from the Department of Energy about realizing a goal of a 40 
uh, percent solar generation for the United States by 2040 and 45 by 2045. We will lead this effort, and uh, we need to be helped to be funded to be first in line. And, uh, and we are already on our way to meeting these dramatic goals on decarbonization, particularly in the use of solar. And I do also want to commend Senator Schumer's commitment to help fund not only the solar initiatives, but the whole variety of issues on energy efficiency and, um, and climate resilience. But quite honestly, without that massive amount of federal funding, uh, this will, again, as I have commented multiple times, put a disproportionate burden on ratepayers to meet our goals. And it will be absolutely necessary for Washington to help us out. And again, emphasize, because we're going first, we should be get our funding first. And uh, with that, uh, I turn it over to Commissioner Berman for comments. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a question on the uh, Technical Resource Manual Committee and adding NYSERDA as a voting member. Um, I am concerned about that, um, and I do appreciate the concern of the stakeholders who um, are not necessarily supportive of that. Can you explain to me um, why staff feels comfortable with allowing them to be a voting member, um, and then what the process will be kind of going forward in, in handling that? Certainly. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a very, very brief little bit of background on the Technical Resource Manual uh, we refer to as the TRM. Uh, the TRM is a, a standard tool that many jurisdictions have that is basically used to have a common approach to estimating energy savings for the most common types of measures offered in programs. It, our TRM has some other information in there, also including approaches to how we approach custom energy modeling and whatnot. There seems to have developed, and, and I've been at this for quite some time, I'm not exactly sure where uh, this comes from, but there seems to be a misconception of the TRM applies to utilities and not to NYSERDA. That is an incorrect uh, perception. I think, more importantly, if the TRM, um, if a program is offering prescriptive measures, say um, LED light lighting, we should have a standard approach for how we estimate savings for LED lighting, regardless of who the program administrator is who's incenting that. And so therefore, um, as we've come through time, the, I think where the perception comes from is NYSERDA had traditionally offered much more complex and custom type approaches where you maybe do custom engineering modeling and did not rely on prescriptive algorithms in the TRM. So I think that's where the perception comes from. But the reality is, if it is appropriate to use a standardized approach to estimating savings, that should apply to any P program administrator that we have. So the petition kind of points this out, <laughs> that um, NYSERDA has always been involved with the TRM, but had not had an opportunity to be a voting member, to bring forth measures, uh, to comment on measures, and to help improve the estimation approaches. So um, we think this is a correction, and an appropriate correction. And beyond that, as we have continued to try to find ways in which the utilities and NYSERDA efforts coordinate with one another, it's even more important that program administrators are using common approaches to estimating savings so that we don't end up in a situation where the same measure would be installed with two different estimation approaches. Okay, I, I can understand that. I will put up a caution um, on this approach. Um, I'm not sure that having NYSERDA um, continue as a non-voting member um, is a problem. I am concerned that adding them as a voting member may have a unintended consequence where NYSERDA intentionally or not um, tries to shape um, the vote in a way that if the, unless others agree with them, um, they won't support um, a reasonable approach. And so their one vote can change the course of um, uh, the entire 
outcome. And so the goal for me, as I see it, is to ensure that by adding them as a voting member, that they're not actually chilling the ongoing communication and the nature of the way the TRM committee has operated and that they don't somehow um, unintentionally or intentionally hold up um, things because it's if they don't vote for it, there needs to be unanimous approval. And so I would say we need to be very focused as we are in the order. We talk about the executive council also and coming to back to us if there's an issue. Staff and the commission needs to really be focused on making sure that our now inclusion of them as a voting member does not um, cause unintended negative consequences. Um, we are also focused on that NYSERDA is to work more collaboratively with the utilities and the order charges the utilities with now having to lay out um, uh, where they are complementing or not um, some of their work product with NYSERDA. I think that's fine. I think we should have that conversation. I just want to make sure that it doesn't now put um, a problematic burden on the utilities that if they are doing something and it doesn't match up with what NYSERDA is doing, that somehow they're dinged for that. It may be that NYSERDA is the one that needs to change its operations to be more in line or complementary of the utilities activities, vice versa. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're kind of really looking at this and ensuring that this new focus of collaboration doesn't become collaboration only if you agree with where NYSERDA is or only if you're solely aligned with where NYSERDA is. That's not to say that NYSERDA won't have and do, does have a lot of value to add. It's just, it's not necessarily always going to be a pure matchup. So we need to really, I think, be mindful of that. Does that make sense? Does that? Or it, let me just comment, I guess, on, on three points. To the TRM committee, um, perhaps this might give you a little bit more com comfort level. Uh, staff is very closely monitoring and engaged with the TRM management committee. Um, we uh, actively uh, work with them to make sure that changes that are being made are sourced properly and are based on credible and justifiable information. Over the last few years, we've further tried to align our evaluation work with the TRM so that things are rooted and grounded in actual evaluation work to improve those estimates, and that would go for NYSERDA as well as the utilities, and that would be something that staff would continue to monitor and, you know, prevent any um, gaming of the system, I guess, if you will, on, on anyone's account. So uh, hopefully that helps you to understand kind of how the day-to-days work. Related to the coordination efforts, um, your point is taken. I think what the order is trying to address, and this is very challenging, quite frankly, when we have asked a lot of each program administrator to evolve and expand and greatly and expeditiously get to these ambitious goals. Right now, we have pretty much an asymmetrical approach where NYSERDA is expected to shift and change and coordinate and fill gaps of the utility programs, but utilities are not in the same position prior to this order. And we have run into, over the last year to two years, specific proposals coming in, whether those be in efficiency programs or even within rate case settings, where utilities are proposing something that NYSERDA is actively already doing. And so from a total rate payer perspective, we want to be sure that any additional activities is incremental benefit um, and not duplicative for the, you know, making sure that our dollars can go as far as possible. That certainly is easier said than done, and I think it's, uh, we've seen a lot of improvements, I think, from, say, even five, six years ago of um, ongoing relationship building between many of the utility um, executive levels and program staff and NYSERDAs just to try to keep aware of one another's activities, but also to learn 
from each other of what's working and how to evolve those. So I think that will continue to be a work in progress, um, and, and we'll try to figure out ways to make that most efficient and less <laughs> administratively burdensome. Uh, but the intention, I think, is really to try to be um, as appropriate with ratepayers' expenditures as possible so that we're making the best use of these dollars. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the other, I think, sort of focus I just wanted to mention is um, there is a lot of focus in waiting for the Climate Action Council, um, waiting for decisions on the CLCPA, waiting for the Climate um, Justice Group um, to uh, make some decisions. I, I, I don't think it's as clear as it could be in the order that um, we are not prejudging uh, not just what the Climate Action Council and the other entities um, may do, but we're not prejudging how we may actually um, decide things. Um, those recommendations through the um, scoping plan um, or then, you know, for us to determine how it fits within our regulatory framework and the necessary processes that we have in place um, from an um, uh, Im important uh, perspective. And so, um, you know, for me, I want to make clear that folks understand that we're not just a rubber stamp of whatever does or does not get done, um, and that we will also have to clearly evaluate it and look at it from um, the overall perspective, um, not just in the silo of uh, the Climate Action Council, but in our overall um, jurisdictional regulatory um, responsibilities uh, and, and how that fits or not. Um, the other thing, I, I, I guess I would be looking for a little bit more um, uh, information on how we will be ensuring that NYSERDA going forward is carefully evaluating the metrics and the implementation of what they are doing. And to the extent that we are concerned about um, the costs um, and also the significant um, uh, dollars that have been collected, it's not to me just about saying, okay, make sure you get those um, out the door and spend them. Um, it may not necessarily um, be appropriate. So for me, it's about what are we doing in ensuring that we're moving forward in a way that is showing success and is showing um, forward progress. Uh, and, and I'm just kind of concerned in the focus of saying, hurry up and make sure you're spending, um, because I'm not necessarily sure, um, especially as we haven't put a hard stop on um, w w when collections will end. Um, I do sort of take a lot of what MI has said um, seriously uh, and think that we do need to sort of send signals about the impact on ratepayer collections and not this sort of ongoing um, padding of increased uh, ratepayer collections that may be there. Right. So, so point taken, and I think um, the mm -hmm. order tries to speak to this, and hopefully it, it comes through in some areas. Um, expeditious spending is not the goal. It's expeditious and effective, right? And so I think um, that is a fair point. And I think one that uh, NYSERDA is keenly focused on as far as trying to achieve these very ambitious goals with the dollars allocated to them. So I think that, that point is taken. Um, we have instituted and NYSERDA has uh, definitely in, in my work uh, and oversight of this portfolio over the last couple of years, I've been impressed with some of the new things that they put in place internal to track progress. And, and I think you saw that in the petition where they're proposing a shift from these committed views to acquired views. That gives them a whole different framework to be measuring what's effective. And so they've um, 
in the investment plan process that we have, as well as the quarterly reporting, they have ver a variety of different metrics um, and kind of leading signs. You know, some of the stuff is long-term plays, not just in, in uh, simple uh, 1990 vintage DSM programs, but um, they do. They have developed uh, better internal tracking systems to monitor progress. We've um, also modified our uh, quarterly reporting and we have a dashboard now where we track things on a quarterly basis. So we, I believe, have put in place many tools in order to help us further monitor. And I think you, you see this in the item. Um, and as the chair mentioned, where staff, that's our role, right? We'll be monitoring these things. And if we start to see uh, things coming off of expectations, that's where we would be engaging further and trying to really get under the hood and see what's what's causing that. That said, I will you know, be honest in the sense that these are all very new and different initiatives. Market development alone has nearly 70 different initiatives, some of which no one's tried before. So within that portfolio, there will be some that don't hit marks. There will be some failures, but if we don't pilot new and different approaches, we're not going to learn from that. So I think uh, that's really a portfolio management exercise and to allow for some flexibility for uh, a little bit of risk taking to try to get to some more novel approaches to this area. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to thank uh, you and the rest of the staff for all your hard work um, on these issues. It's really important. I also want to thank um, NYSERDA because I think they have really uh, tried to um, listen to some of the concerns. Um, and that goes, um, you know, to me, I'm seeing uh, a more willingness to uh, engage in a way that uh, I think is helpful. And just my own concerns again on the TRM um, and other uh, engagement with the utilities and NYSERDA, making sure that we're carefully on top of that in a way that um, is helping facilitate productive um, uh, uh, communication and collaboration rather than more of a chilling effect. Um, I will be concurring on this order, um, and I also appreciate that we have uh, really tried to set up some, I think, um, fiscal responsibility and some guardrails in place on that. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berman. <clears throat> Commissioner Alisi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure I have any questions on this at this point, but I would like to make uh, some observations, uh, if I may. Um, I, I believe that this is going to be uh, very helpful uh, as we strive to meet our carbon-free uh, climate goals. Uh, it, it will allow for NYSERDA to uh, deliver the benefits of our policy objectives by putting funds to work in the most efficient ways. Uh, it should be noted as we pursue our climate initiatives, uh, the implementation of funding will also benefit disadvantaged communities. Uh, this multifaceted approach will enable us to achieve a clean and healthy environment as we heat our homes, cook our food, and light our way into a carbon-free future. Thank Th you. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Yes, I just want to thank you and the team for putting this together, especially the modifications. There's two key points that I just want to emphasize on what you said. It said that the order strongly reinforces the need for NYSERDA to put this funding to work effectively and expeditiously. It provides additional measures to monitor ex uh, expenditures against expectations and a greater emphasis on metrics, clarity, and are in line with our clean energy and oversight transparency. I just want to you know, agree with you wholeheartedly. Thank you for the work. In order for us to get this done and done timely, it's going to take communication, integration, flawless as much as possible execution of initiatives, partnership, inclusive, uh, inclusive uh, initiatives, and also holding ourselves accountable. 
This is, there's a lot that's in here. But it's only going to work if we make it work. So I want to thank you and the team uh, sort of for putting all this together. And I look forward to the partnership that we're going to have in the ongoing dialogue uh, in order to get this done. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. Commissioner Valeski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I'd just like to second the comments that you made earlier, Chairman Howard, in regard to the leadership from <clears throat> the President and the Senate Majority Leader and the federal government in terms of uh, ensuring that we are able to meet um, the aggressive goals that are set in, in our statute. We have been a leader, and uh, I think we'll continue to be a leader, but it will be critically important for, for that uh, federal support. Peggy, I just want to thank you and your entire team for the review of NYSERDA's proposal, the changes, the very positive changes that you and your colleagues um, have made. I think they're very important, and, and they've been touched upon by previous speakers. So I want to acknowledge your effort for that. And I also want to say, uh, in, in taking a step back and looking at the whole of the product and, and the fact that the fund's overall performance is generally trending toward the goals that were established some five years ago by, by this commission, um, with, two, with two exceptions in terms of the metrics that are lagging, very logical explanations for that. Um, and therefore, as we check in at this halfway point, it's certainly, I think, um, important to acknowledge um, the efforts made by our colleagues at NYSERDA in managing, um, managing this fund, which, you know, certainly a reminder that the commission that established these goals happening well before the CLCPA um, I think ever was even legislation, let alone, uh, let alone statute. So I think that's really important. And I also just want to, um, Peggy, I know Commissioner Berman indicated earlier the work of the, the continuing work of the Climate Action Council and other related organizations. Uh, in four months, we'll have a draft scoping plan from them. In 16 months, according to the, the law, that scoping plan will be um, in effect. Uh, so the fact that you have recommended and included in this order that we take another look at this fund to coincide um, with the timeliness of, of the scoping plan, I think that's really important. There are so many pieces out there um, that are all at times moving or it, it can be perceived as moving in their own direction, and the more that we can bring all of this together um, and so that we ensure and we as a commission do our part in ensuring that that everything is moving together and in sync um, toward meeting these goals as we as we um, uh, move along uh, move along that process so I think that's important and I just wanted to underscore that and again thanks for the great work thank you thank you Commissioner Valeski Commissioner Majori thank you Mr. Chair um, so I'm going to be happy to be voting yes on this order uh, the CLCPA requires increased sources of renewable energy and decreased energy consumption. In my previous career, I was part of the team that shepherded in some of the component policies that exist within the CEF. I say that not to take credit because many others are more directly responsible than myself, but as an indication of my alignment. The other reason I mentioned my past career is that I viewed and continue to view something like the CEF or even the CLCPA itself as tools to achieve a goal that is much bigger than any one policy or package of policies can achieve. The CEF will continue to help New York maintain its position as a clean energy leader. Indeed, a $6 billion program puts real heft behind the state's commitment to achieving clean energy goals. But there is a paradox about a program of this size. In addition to clean energy obligations, this body has a statutory obligation to ensure energy affordability. Further, the fight against climate change will not be advanced if the cost of doing business in New York rises past the point that the kind of economic growth that we experienced over the decade pre-pandemic is chased to other states that aren't as committed to clean energy. The planet's climate does not recognize state borders. As significant as the CEF is, the challenge of climate change requires transformative change to how we live our lives on this planet. As ongoing extreme weather events remind us, we are past the point of saying that if we don't change the way we live as it relates to energy consumption, nature will change it for us. 
six billion dollars spread out across a decade is not nearly enough to foster the kind of societal change that is necessary to have enough of an impact in the struggle against climate change. But a fund twice as large or 100 times as large won't on its own be enough. The CEF is a very important part of the solution, but it is only a part. Climate goals should continue to saturate a wide swath of state policies. Over the past 10 years, sustainable development infused state policies. In part, as a result, New York's population grew by a number exceeding the entire population of five states. But the increased population did not sprawl across New York. Already developed areas grew, in some cases for the first time in my lifetime. New York, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany all grew. This did not happen on its own. I mention this because there is a negative correlation between energy consumption and urban density. Decarbonizing what already exists is an enormous task. Adding to our task is building clean for a new population roughly the size of North Dakota. Make no mistake, this CEF provides many tools to advance towards these goals, but they cannot be the only tools. And utility ratepayers cannot be the only source of funding for all the tools necessary for the task. So while happily voting yes on this proposal, I join Chair Howard in his optimism with President Biden's announcement yesterday and Senator Schumer's work and acknowledge the need for additional assistance from the federal government. And I would further call on our fellow state policymakers to continue to find new ways to work climate goals throughout the broad swath of state policy. Finally, I'd like to staff, uh, thank staff for their great and hard work and uh, thank NYSERDA for what they're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Majori. <clears throat> Commissioner Christian. Thank you, Howard. Uh, first off, I'm very encouraged by the overall direction of the CEF. And uh, though we're moving in the right direction, it's clear that the pace of that progress will need to be accelerated. And the recent flooding from Hurricane Ida downstate should serve as a reminder to all of us of what's at stake. This order seeks to do that, accelerate our progress, establishing new metrics and requirements that will allow the state to better allocate its resources in an efficient and importantly inclusive manner to achieve the current goals. But more importantly, we'll have the information needed to position future programs for even greater success. Today's order should not be seen as the end of this commission's efforts to address climate change, but as one of many steps in an innovative process that will continue for years to come. With that context, several items of this order position us to make significant near-term progress above and beyond what has been done in the past. First off, the acknowledgement that the commitments of the past uh, are insufficient and need to be expanded for us to achieve our climate and energy goals. And second, and most importantly, and some of this has already been mentioned by Ms. Neville, uh, a commitment that 40% of the benefits of these investments materialize in disadvantaged communities, and a further requirement that the Green Bank allocate at a minimum 35% of its capital into those communities going forward. Uh, these two things alone would be significant in and of themselves, but when added to the fact of uh, significant increases in budget towards certain programs, particularly the market development budget, which sees a significant increase in investments in workforce development and low and moderate income energy efficiency, um, I see this as a very strong step forward towards achieving our goals, again, in an efficient and inclusive manner. Uh, I'm looking forward to the follow-up items that we'll be addressing in the next few months related to the CEF um, as we align it more closely with the requirements of the CLCPA uh, at the end of the CAC's process. Uh, I want to thank staff for their work on this, uh, and I'm excited by the opportunity this represents. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Christian. Uh I'll now call for a vote on this item. Uh, my vote is in favor of the recommendation to modify the Clean Energy Fund as discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? I concur. Commissioner Alisi? Yes. Commissioner Edwards? Yes. Commissioner Valeski? Yes. Commissioner Majori? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, 
the item is approved and the recommendations are adopted. Thank you, Peggy and Dave. Thank you. We'll now move to our next item for discussion, item 301, case 20-E0197, as it relates to local transmission and distribution planning phase two. It'll be presented by Elizabeth, <coughs> Elizabeth Gressu and uh, from the Office of uh, Electric and Gas and Water and Zarai Hagos, Deputy Director of Clean Energy and Markets and Mary Ann Sorrentino, Chief of Upstate Rates and Tariffs, and Dave Drexler, or will you available for questions? Liz, uh, can you please begin? Yes, I'm happy to. Good morning. Can you hear me? Um, is this on? The green light is on. You're good. Okay, good. Good morning, Chair Howard and Commissioners. I'm very pleased to present to you today a draft order that advances this Commission's implementation of the 2020 Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act. This statute, which I will refer today as the Act, requires the Commission and New York's utilities to develop transmission and distribution investment plans that will help the state meet the climate targets codified in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that we have been referring to today as the CLCPA. To be clear, the statute requires a new transmission planning process, one focused on meeting the goals of the CLCPA. The Commission took up the legislature's directives when it opened this proceeding in May of 2020 and sought proposals from the utilities for first, transmission project selection criteria and funding mechanisms, and second, potential upgrade projects that would support the state's climate goals. The utilities responded with a filing in November of 2020 that addressed both of the Commission's directives they identified two categories of local transmission and distribution upgrades, which they characterized as phase one and phase two projects. Phase one projects are traditional utility investments that address system reliability or resilience issues and also have ancillary CLCPA benefits, such as increasing local system capacity to integrate renewable energy sources. The commission issued an order last February, 2021 excuse me, providing guidance on phase one projects. In contrast, phase two projects are investments that would be made primarily for the purpose of achieving CLCPA goals. The order before you today takes up the CLCPA investment criteria, funding options, and phase two upgrades proposed in that November filing. These issues are new and in this area, the Commission would be breaking ground by establishing a new category of transmission and distribution investment that has not been an objective of the utilities planning and capital spending programs up to this time. Because the climate change is critical, because the climate challenge, excuse me, the climate challenge is so critical and because the Act requires the Commission to develop new processes, today's draft order takes a deliberate approach. The goal, as with everything we do, is to meet the state's climate targets through the most cost-effective expenditure of ratepayer dollars possible. First, I note that this draft order does not approve any specific phase two investments. Rather, it requires the utilities to refine a number of their proposals in accordance with the Commission's guidance and to resubmit the more fully developed proposals in future filings for further consideration and evaluation. I'll briefly review those topics that require reconsideration. First, the order directs the utilities to revise their proposed benefit cost analysis after consulting with staff and to resubmit it within 90 days. If other changes to their proposed investment criteria are warranted in light of changes to the benefit cost analysis, the utilities are required to file those as well. Second, the draft order would require the utilities to work with stakeholders, staff, NYSERDA, and the NISO to develop and then file a transmission planning process that meets the standards for transparency, consistency of models, and coordination established in this draft order. While the order recognizes that this will be a significant effort, it is essential to the implementation of the act 
and a filing is required within 90 days. Next, funding for CLCPA-driven phase two local transmission and distribution is another issue that requires further development. The draft order notes that mechanisms for cost recovery and cost allocation for this new type of investment do not exist at this time. The draft order approves the utility's proposal to charge the costs of phase two projects across ratepayers under a volumetric load ratio share allocation. The draft also finds <clears throat> that a FERC approved participant funding agreement among the utilities could establish an equitable system for sharing the costs of these projects. However, a number of details still need to be explored to determine exactly how such an agreement would be implemented. A further filing on this topic is required within 120 days after consultation with staff. The draft, <clears throat> excuse me, the draft uh, rejects the utility's proposal to bring their potential phase two investments into the commission's uh, ongoing rate cases. Rather, the commission will establish a specific forum for coordinated review of these projects and their costs from a whole state perspective on a repeatable cycle. The draft order directs the utilities to develop their first portfolio of phase two local transmission and distribution projects through the revised planning process and to submit those proposed upgrades to the Commission by January 1st of 2023. Those filings will be required to meet rate case standards and the Commission may accept, reject, or modify any Phase two proposals. Only those upgrades approved by the Commission would be eligible for cost recovery. While no phase two projects are approved here, the order recognizes that there are certain areas of the state <clears throat> where renewable generation is already bottled and where additional generation projects are either in development or expected to be developed in the future. The draft directs the relevant utility companies to address these particular areas of concern with detailed phase two proposals, including options based on their assessment of these areas development potential. The proposals are to be filed within 180 days. Last, <clears throat> the draft order adopts staff's <clears throat> recent proposal for revising the way the utilities calculate headroom on the grid. That is the system's ability or capacity to integrate renewable generation. In order to support NYSERDA's ongoing generation procurement programs, the order directs the utilities to provide this updated headroom data to staff NYSERDA and potential bidders no later than February 1, 2022. This step would provide bidders with more transparency regarding the system's ability to accommodate new projects, therefore providing a better foundation for the bids. This concludes my <coughs> overview of the draft order and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Liz. I have a couple of questions. Um, when do you estimate we will see specific proposals, meaning when will we see real maps with real lines that represent real power lines? Uh, sure. With respect to the, the, the areas of concern that I, I mentioned, uh, we should get those proposals within 180 days, so we should be able to see uh, exactly what uh, upgrades or, or projects the utilities are proposing in response to our request. So that is, I guess, six months from now. Uh, with respect to the larger potential portfolio of, uh, of phase two projects more generally, uh, that, that is the submission I talked about as being made at the January 1 of 2023, so that's a couple of years out. Great, thank you. And when we get those six months from now, those some specific proposals, will we also get specific costs associated with them? Yes, as I mentioned, we expect these to be rate case quality filings that would provide all of the information the, com the commission would need in the rate case context to evaluate, uh, <clears throat> to evaluate the projects and the proposed investments, including, of course, uh, uh, cost estimates. Thank you. And I have a couple of comments. Well, today really does ish usher in a new era of transmission planning in New York State. Remember, we should remind us traditional planning by utilities was to serve their native load, specifically. 
and particularly based on a fossil and nuclear-based uh, system. This paradigm will redesign the system to meet renewable goals statewide and will require an unprecedented level of cooperation between transmission owners. And we have never seen that before. It is truly something that will be nearly Herculean in its effort, largely because we are going in such a new and bold direction. And again, like my previous comments on the last item, New York State is leading the nation in grid decarbonization. We are not w just walking the walk. We are running the run. And this new initiative we know will cost billions of dollars. And it is, will be imperative to, again, ask the federal government to help New York fund these projects uh, in such a way that as not to discriminate or overburden utility rate payers. It is clearly this level of, of commitment and investment under this short period of time is unprecedented and really unsustainable purely on the backs of rate payers. So that federal partnership will be necessary to limit those impacts and I do have increased optimism that that will be uh, realized. Again, when you're going first, you need the help. And again, uh, we are going first, and we are going fast. So with that, uh, that's my comments, and I will now turn it over to Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, can you explain to me uh, why staff has recommended that we reject the utilities proposal to bring the potential phase two investments into the commission's rate cases. Uh, yes, I'll, I'd <clears throat> be very happy, and uh, my colleague Marianne Sorrentino may have some further details uh, on exactly that question, but my understanding from working with the rates team is that the staggered schedule of rate cases, uh, that's, you know, that's what we live with, and that if you try to layer on top of that an accounting for, for um, an accounting uh, that attempts to approximate an equitable allocation across the very same utilities uh, raises a whole bunch of administrative uh, complications uh, that we thought um, you know, made, made it perhaps too unwieldy to do that way and risked putting uh, some burdens on ratepayers that we could avoid by taking this other approach. Marian, do you want to add anything? I'll just add one thing. Um, if we are to do it through a separate process, it would be, um, it would be similar amongst utilities if we were to do it through utility rate cases, you could have base rate recovery for one utility and surcharges through another. So we really thought that if you did it consistently throughout the state, it would be better from a ratepayer perspective with respect to transparency. Thank you. Um, and can you explain to me what you see as the next step process, including the timeline for establishing this specific forum? for this coordinated review? Sure. Um, we, we, we didn't pick that date out of a hat. <laughs> January 1, 2023, per the statute, per the Accelerated Renewable um, Energy Growth Act, is supposed to be the kickoff for the Commission's first review of this transmission and distribution planning program. So, <clears throat> so we thought that provided a good sort of a touchstone uh, and also provided enough time for the utilities to engage in the revamped planning process that we are contemplating and to produce um, uh, an effective and well-coordinated well -coordinated por portfolio of, of potential projects. So it seemed like that statutory review date uh, gave us enough bandwidth of time for the utilities to do what they need to do, and so that's why we, that's why we landed there. Okay. Um, I, I can appreciate that and the reasoning behind that. I will just say I am a little concerned, um, especially in, you know, for me, making sure that we move forward um, smartly but expeditiously. And to the extent that we may be able to in some potential um, upcoming rate cases, look at things um, before that. I don't want that this to seem like we are saying, nope, can't discuss it, even if it makes sense. Um, and so for me, 
It's just being cognizant of the fact that we should be somewhat flexible in what may work um, and not getting, I, I worry that we get bogged down and that that then punting um, to another forum or proceeding winds up actually um, delaying in a way that we never get to it um, and that it might be appropriate at some point if we see that to be able to address it. So I just share that with you. Um, if I could, if I could, sure. just to provide some, perhaps some reassurance. Um, uh, in our work uh, uh, through the power grid study that was also initiated under the same act, um, uh, utilities and staff identified uh, this category of phase one projects, which this commission addressed in February. And uh, we have good reason to believe that those phase one projects will achieve significant CLCPA benefits. And in the phase one order, the commission encouraged the utilities, in fact, directed the utilities to identify those projects and to move them forward uh, because they do capture benefits. Um, uh, so, so I think we, you know, the fact that we are waiting to see the phase two portfolio, uh, yes, there, there are reasons why that's necessary, but, but the utilities and staff with the commission's encouragement are, will be moving forward on those phase one projects in the interim. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. And let, let me add two more points. One is, <laughs> this is Bob Rosenthal. January 1, 2023 is the deadline. I think that it actually could be you know, sooner than that. That's the deadline that we're setting. Um, two is, is the order identifies three areas of, of concern that we know about. That does not foreclose the utilities from identifying other areas of concern that I think we could take up sooner. Okay, great, thank you. I appreciate uh, your comments on that. Um, the only other thing is that I, I do believe that there are a lot of folks who are anxiously awaiting um, the next steps in um, the bulk proceedings. And I wondered if you could comment a little bit uh, on that and where we may be going. Uh, I, I, I take it you mean um, the NISO's uh, offshore, the solicitation for the Long Island time? Yep. Um, the only update I have on that, uh, Mr. Rosenthal may know more, is that um, uh, I believe uh, proposals from developers are due within the next 45 days or so. So the process is moving along according to the NISO's schedule. Okay, great. And how will, um, how will this fit from a looking at what FERC is doing? Um, there's a lot that's there um, kind of on the horizon. Um, there will be a lot of changes. Um, at FERC um, with a uh, 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 new commissioner coming on. Um, and I'm just curious on how we're making sure that a lot of this collaboration, not just on these issues, but overall um, FERC-related issues uh, that will impact us are being looked at and monitored. From, from just the perspective of this order, uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, the, the revamped planning process that we are directing the utilities to, to build. Uh, we specifically uh, point to the fact that we have multiple planning entities and that one of our challenges is to integrate better the, uh, the wholesale level, the bulk planning uh, processes that the NISO administers with uh, all the other, <clears throat> excuse me, all the other uh, initiatives that the utilities are responsible for. So. We, we expect this planning process to, um, you know, to produce a, I, I, I'll repeat the same word, a coordinated uh, statewide um, assessment that will reflect what is going on in the uh, NISO's planning processes and, and respond to and integrate with what's happening at the bulk level. Um, as you know, the commission has a, has a significant role in the shape of the public policy planning process that the, that the NISO undertakes. Um, so we are in a sense building on that and bringing the rest of the system, uh, bringing all those parts of the system together. Um, as to what FERC is up to, I defer to Mr. Rosenthal. The only thing that I, I would add is you know that FERC issued, um, you know, a few notices and created a working group with NARUC regarding, you know, new transmission types of processes. Um, and so we do identify in this order, <laughs> at least one of those um, 
you know, notices that FERC issued, um, given that we ourselves are creating a new process, um, we've identified FERC as um, the entity that might may be able to assist us in terms of rate recovery associated um, with this new process. Um, we and I can tell you that we have begun, you know, our discussions um, with with the NISO about potentially helping us just administer the cost sharing aspect of that process. Right, and this obviously deals with you know small scale transmission, and we at the PSC broke it up into um, uh, the two proceedings, distribution and bulk power. So on that side of it, um, outside of the offshore wind, you know, where's that process and next sort of phase of it? Um, so, so again, referring to the results of the power grid study, uh, we, the, we, the staff recommended that the, that the commission pay very close attention to the, um, to the cycle of bulk system studies uh, so as to stay ahead of the, the bulk system needs that we expect to, to emerge, particularly as we get into 2030. Um, uh, so we, we, we are right now continuing to rely on those processes. We expect to take up that question. Um, we expect to bring back to this commission uh, uh, some further recommendations relating to the, rec relating to the power grid study uh, in a subsequent order. Okay, I, th I think um, I'm anxious for that, um, and I think uh, there's a number of stakeholders who are probably also anxious for that. So um, I think anything we can do in terms of looking at that and giving some indication of um, where we may be, um, even if it's just on the timing aspect, I think is likely to be helpful. Um, so thank you, I appreciate it. I will be concurring um, on this item. Thank you. Commissioner Alisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions or, uh, at this point, but I will be supporting the item. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Uh, you know, like Peggy, Elizabeth, the community did a really good job of this. I love the fact that there's flexibility that allows the utilities to modify their proposals, resubmit, so that the winning team and all of us can hold them accountable to what they submitted. I truly like that approach, and I appreciate the work that's been done on this. This is really an important day. You know, these are two really good, thoughtful, important items that are going to move us forward. So I, uh, I appreciate, Chair, you putting these two agenda, agenda items on today, especially together. Um, glad to be a part of this today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Valeski. I would just uh, concur with certainly the importance of this item uh, today in this order today and, and um, its significance going forward in, in the larger picture. The only, the, the only question I was going to ask, Liz, and thanks for your great work, you and your team, Commissioner Berman has already addressed it, um, the issue of, 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 of not um, agreeing with the utilities proposal of doing the phase two projects as part of their rate case. Haven't been here long enough to... Uh, um, to have uh, uh, experience, so I'll certainly take your recommendation as that this is uh, certainly the best way to go, but would also echo Commissioner Berman's thoughts about would not want the date of January 1st, 2023 to inadvertently cause us to not move something forward more quickly if, if, uh, if such a uh, phase, two, phase two project would be ready to do so. And the, I guess the only follow-up would be, so phase one proposals, they are included in the rate, in the rate cases and phase two will now not, is that correct? Uh, in, the, in the phase one order, um, we, we, the commission said that the rate case process is the sort of preferred venue, the preferred uh, place to uh, look at phase one projects because they are essentially the same traditional utility investments that the companies bring forward. Right in the ordinary course, they're not driven by CLCPA right. needs. So we said that's the default mechanism, bring them into the rate case, but we also put the burden on the utilities 
uh, to identify. If, if you see CLCPA deadlines moving up and you think something needs to be done sooner in order to help meet those deadlines uh, and you don't want to wait for the rate case, we authorize the utilities to come in by petition uh, you know, with specific phase one proposals. Okay, good. I think that maximum flexibility is really important. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Majori. I have nothing really to add, but I would like to again thank uh, staff for their, their work on this and their uh, continued diligence on the issue. Uh, other than that, I do intend to vote yes on this measure. Thank you. Commissioner Christian. Thank you, Chair Howard. Um, I think your statements earlier, Chair Howard, um, capture my sentiment towards this order. Uh, I plan to vote yes. Um, I, I believe that the new approach uh, is going to not only make it uh, maximize the effectiveness of the investments in the near term, but also maximize the ability to meet the goals of the system of tomorrow that we see. Um, so I believe these changes uh, and this direction is sound, and uh, I want to thank staff for uh, putting this forward and making this happen. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Christian. I will, I will now call for a vote. And my vote is in favor of the recommendation to adopt staff's uh, straw proposal and direct the utilities to make additional filings as discussed. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? I concur. Commissioner Alisi? Yes. Commissioner Edwards? Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Valeski? Yes. Commissioner Majori? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. The item is approved and the recommendation is adopted. Uh, we now move to the consent agenda. Uh, I will now ask for any comments on the, any items on the consent agenda. I'll begin with Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to mention um, I have a couple item 161 um, and just in general, uh, the, our Dig Safely programs. Um, as uh, folks know, the Commission does have a responsibility for developing and enforcing regulations for the protection of underground facilities known as Part 753, more commonly referred to as 811, Call Before You Dig or Dig Safely. New York State has two one-call notification centers covering the state and excavators may provide notice of intent to excavate by contacting the appropriate one-call notification center. Dig Safely New York covers all counties except the Bronx, Kings, New York, Kings, Richmond, Queens, NASA, and Suffolk, and New York 811 covers all of New York City and Long Island. Um, this is a crucial time for energy regulators to be involved in safety, and the critical issues we deal with um, are really important. I do believe we can get to zero incidences um, uh, and we can do so in my regulatory lifetime, but it requires um, all of us working together, um, not just FIMSA uh, and the state regulators, but also um, uh, all stakeholders, uh, utilities, as well as um, folks involved, uh, New York uh, Dig Safely and New York 811, um, and the, uh, those folks who are excavators as well working together. For me, I do think it's important for us to take a good look at what we are doing in this area um, and make sure that we are trending in a positive way where we're seeing decreases in incidences and helping to identify areas for this continuous improvement, um, what that may mean. For me specifically, um, I think as a general observation, I think we need to be very mindful of looking at um, further engagement that may be able to happen um, with uh, our uh, fellow partners, uh, New York 811 and Dig Safely New York. Um, but also the municipalities um, and how we can focus on that. Enforcement dollars, um, as originally intended, really need to go for the training and the retraining, both of excavators um, and of staff. And that's really, for us, important to make sure that we are utilizing um, those enforcement dollars to ensure that it is going there. 
And the other thing is we may need to look at whether or not the fines that um, are, um, are uh, identified, if they're really high enough to change behavior, um, I think that for small excavators, they may be, um, but to the extent that we're looking, it's not just about the penalty or the fine, but really it's about whether it's changing behavior and the continuous improvement of that. We've done a lot of good work, especially with the municipalities, in ensuring that um, they are more mindful of uh, ensuring training, um, but there is a continual uh, 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 turnover of staff, uh, new companies come online, et cetera, and it's making sure that we continually educate and work through those challenges in a way that is helpful. Um, I myself have utilized as a homeowner um, the Dig Safely program uh, and found it to be very helpful. Um, it's also helpful for um, you know folks in, in my family to see that what they thought was uh, you know, not a big deal to dig that um, by calling um, dig safely and having them come out to see just how many things were underground that could be a problem um, if they started digging. Um, so I just mentioned that because I do think it's really important for us to do all we can to make folks understand that this is a top priority for us. Um, on items 268, 380, 381, and 383, I will be concurring. Um, I do just want to mention on 381, this is the tier two focus. There is language in here that talks in the order um, about um, prioritizing ESCOs and CCAs. Um, we really do, um, as a commission, need to really get under the hood a little bit more on um, what we're doing, especially on CCAs, um, and make sure that we are um, um, being successful and uh, continuously improving in that area. Um, and that's really it. The, so 268 so for uh, Secretary Phillips, 268, 380, 381, and 383. I'll be concurring. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lisi, do you have any comments? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. No, I don't have any comments, but I just want to thank Commissioner Berman on her thoughts on Dig Safely. I agree with her. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Valeski. Uh, just a, one a comment on one item and certainly keeping with the theme from earlier, from the item earlier on transmission. Just want to uh, highlight item number 373. This is the Article 7 project uh, and the joint proposal signed by New York Transco for the, the, the project in Orange County and just highlight not only the staff of this agency but also DEC, uh, Ag and Markets, my former agency, and the Office of Parks. It's a good example of, of um, staff at, at multiple agencies uh, advocating on behalf of the constituencies that they, uh, that they represent. Um, and I think this is important to note um, that um, Item 373 um, is the, uh, uh, the order to grant the um, Article 7 certificate to New York Transco, and uh, that process continues. Um, thank you. Commissioner Majori. I have no comments. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Christian. Uh, I have comments uh, similar to Commissioner Bourbon's on Item 161. And I have some questions uh, regarding item 268, uh, the NIMO East Pulaski substation project. So I'll, I'll start with my comments regarding item 161. Um, much of this will follow what Commissioner Berman said earlier. Uh, but simply put, engaging in digging without knowing what lies beneath uh, can cause some very significant negative consequences. Uh, consequences to the excavator involved, the property owners nearby, the utility, customers, the surrounding community, and the environment. Uh, the near-term damage to property, life, and livelihood is often quite traumatic and quite acute. Um, explosions are potential outcomes. But the long-term damage, uh, meaning methane leaks, cannot be understated. Uh, fortunately, the consequences of this particular incident were relatively minor. And I want to add that my comments here today are not specific to this incident, 
but serve to highlight a worrisome trend and uh, raise questions concerning how we approach these incidents overall. Um, for violations such as this, uh, essentially excavating without a one call ticket, the commission has the authority to enact penalties of up to $2,500 for the first incident and up to $10,000 for subsequent incidents. Um, and as uh, Commissioner Bourbon stated earlier, the purpose of these penalties is not to generate revenue, but to drive compliance and ensure public safety. The logic being if the penalties are high enough, people will do their best to avoid them. The penalty amounts are detailed in Article 36 of the General Business Law, where these maximum values are established. These values have remained unchanged for over 20 years. Since joining the commission, I've reviewed over 20 similar incidents where an excavator has failed to follow the one call system and use proper protocols. I worry that these maximum penalty amounts do not serve their intended purpose and are an ineffective deterrent for these problems we face. We should be striving for a goal of zero incidents. And if the mechanisms we have in place cannot achieve that, they should be reviewed and modified. And I look forward to working with staff and my fellow commissioners to do just that, minimizing the need to discuss similar issues in the future. Uh, that said, I do want to thank staff uh, for all their efforts in this area and encourage them to continue to support, enforce safety regulations and deter conduct that can endanger the public welfare and the environment. Now, uh, I do have questions concerning item 268. Uh, this is the project for the Nimo East Pulaski substation project concerning battery storage. Uh, I'll ask uh, Marco Padula, our Director of Innovation, and, uh, to uh, be available to answer your questions, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Padula. Uh, my first question concerns the inception of the project, um, how it was originally conceived. Uh, can you share with us the results of the initial cost-benefit analysis and just generally describe the original intent of the project when it was originally conceived? Sure. <clears throat> can you hear me? Excellent. Loud and clear. So um, let me start by saying that um, the, the project really started with the commission's DSIP order, that's a distributed system implementation plan, back in 2017 where the commission recognized that the need for storage moving into the future from 2017 to now and continuing into the future would really become more and more important as an integrated uh, new technology that could be used uh, as an alternative to traditional T&D as well as help to integrate um, store uh, uh, intermittent resources uh, as we're seeing more and more of today. So what the commission uh, said in that order was for all the utilities to um, develop two storage projects by the end of, um, I think it was by the end of 2018, and have those up and running so that the utilities could actually get experience identifying where storage could be used in, in the system, um, uh, also knowing that storage was an infant industry, really to kind of get that industry moving uh, in the right direction, and demonstrating the ability to provide grid functions. So this particular project on, the, on behalf of um, National Grid was um, identified in its rate case that it filed in 2017. And it presented uh, this storage facility along with another one that I believe was in Buffalo. It presented uh, a BCA analysis of that portfolio. It included three different uh, measures in, in its rate case uh, filing. And you could see from, from that uh, initial rate case filing that um, the, the social um, uh, uh, resource cost test that we traditionally use was a little below one. The other uh, test, the UCT test and the RIM test, the UCT was again a little bit below one, but the RIM test was above one. But again, you know, I, I would caution 
those are traditional, very strict, rigid tests, but all the other benefits that I ex that I um, that the commission envisioned in terms of uh, the utility experience, uh, stimulating the market, getting uh, the the utility's ability to to demonstrate how these resources can be, could be used to satisfy grid functions. Those really aren't quantified in those uh, in, in that specific measure. So, and and nor did the commission really require uh, strict interpretation of, of the BCA itself. Just for uh, information, is that helpful? Thank you, Marco. Uh, my next question uh, concerns the potential impact of uh, the new use of this battery storage system on other providers of the services uh, it will be providing. Um, can you speak to that briefly? Sure. So the the two megawatt battery project in the Pulaski uh, area was primarily built to um, mitigate a thermal overload of a transformer in the uh, National Grid substation in that area. Um, in addition, it provides, it can and does provide peak load reduction. And what other resources provide peak load reduction um, in the area, I think, is the question that uh, Commissioner uh, Christian is asking is um, there are the um, demand response program participants, that's the commercial system uh, relief program, and those are voluntary participants that um, play in that program. And then looking at the other uh, services that National Grid wants to, you know, the petition really is asking to be able to use this to play in the wholesale ancillary markets. There are, of course, other uh, generation resources uh, like combined cycle units, hydro units that provide ancillary services. Um, but this two megawatts, you know, is a very small um, piece of that ancillary service market as well. So those are the other resources that provide both peak demand reduction, ancillary service uh, um, services as well. Thank you. So in a nutshell, we're getting more bang for our buck. Is that safe to say? Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, in my opinion, the, um, the, the storage resources that were installed in response to the Commission's order to be integrated into the distribution system um, are doing just that. And what this petition is asking the Commission for is uh, recognizing that there are other wholesale services that the units can provide during the times when it's not needed for that um, traditional T&D reliability need and any revenues that are generated um, by that additional use really go directly to the benefit of ratepayers who are funding uh, these uh, resources from the, from the start. Thank you, Marco. I'm pleased to see um, decisions paying additional dividends above and beyond what's expected. So this is a this is a good reward. Thank you. You're welcome. I will now call for a vote on the consent agenda. Uh, my vote is in favor of recommendation on the consent agenda. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? I vote yes, except for the items where I concurred. Thank you. Commissioner Alisi? Yes. Commissioner Edwards? Yes. Commissioner Valeski? Yes. Commissioner Majori? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Thank you. The items are approved and the recommendations are adopted. Secretary Phillips, is there anything further to come before us today? There's nothing further today. With that, I thank uh, my fellow commissioners and staff, and we'll adjourn this meeting.